How can we even begin to solve our problems when our conversations about them keep breaking down? Two new solutions. Firstly, a book with expert level techniques for having impossible conversations. I believe it is an existential issue, yes. I believe it's an issue for our democracy. I believe it's an issue for our environment. I believe it's an issue for literally any problem that you want to solve. But if you want to solve those problems, look in the mirror. It starts with you listening to somebody first and understanding. So a conversation is the core element. It's the building block for all of this stuff. And a competition to actually have them on a social media site designed around long form, good faith dialogue. The best conversations that I was having was around the dinner table with my friends and family. And then I'd go online and it, mm. it was just so much less valuable. We just wondered out loud about what a platform might look like if we tried to replicate some of those more interesting conversations that we have around the dinner table or with friends and family, but on, a, in, on an online space. But it's not so easy when even the concept of free speech has been weaponized and in some places is considered a cover for reprehensible ideas. So how do we have these conversations in an environment where the whole idea of it is starting to become suspicious? I think the way that we can do this is by the people who aren't absolutely committed to defending their their own side and, and showing the problems on the others, those who will concede that they have extremists of their own and who want to find common ground with people just over the bridge, I think that is who is going to have the best kind of conversations and I think there's a lot more of them than we think there are. And it's one thing to talk about how to have good faith, positive conversations and to treat each other with respect. How easy is it to actually do it? I think everybody is capable of saying, you should listen to other people and have polite conversations. The difficult part is how to do that. And it seems, at least from my experience and from some of those that I've talked to, uh, that he is about as bad at that as anybody. I guess I should be some kind of an avatar for, for the message of my book. But again, anybody who wants to deal with that can reach out to me privately. Uh, Twitter is a performance. I am past the point of concern and I'm actually worried now. I'm worried because we're not talking to each other. I'm worried for large scale macro issues, democratic issues. I'm worried that, I'm worried in my own life that I've lost friends because they've disagreed with things that I've said. People I was extremely close to, someone who came out to, to help me move out of my dad's house when, when my dad died and we're no longer friends from a, of all the silly things from a political disagreement. I've lost friendships over you for, that I've had for literally decades. And those things have all been very recently. And I think it's a, it's a kind of cultural toxin that we have now that's destroying us. You, you, if, if you were an enemy state, you couldn't possibly have manufactured a better ideology to do that and it's taken hold and germinated in our culture and if we want to start making changes to that we have to change ourselves first so we have to be the ones willing to listen we have to be the ones saying you know what I never thought of that that's right it's not going to change on its own global climate change if we don't do anything about it, you cannot talk about it all you want or you can push bogus solutions like recycling because you don't want to hurt people's feelings but if if you, if you're worried about hurting people's feelings by talking about recycling when it comes to anthropogenic climate change, you just wait to see how their feelings are going to be hurt once global sea line, sea, once the catastrophe start things. But the larger point is that what we need to do is we need to speak openly and honestly about things. And if we don't, those problems, the earth doesn't give a shit about you or me. Those problems are going to solve themselves. So those problems, it might not be the solution that we want. The root of this whole thing is conversation. It's discourse, it's dialogue, it's listening, it's understanding. It doesn't matter if it's an ecological problem or any other problem. That's the first place that we have to start. The most important thing is conversation, listening, and having, having an ability to know how to have those conversations. I read the book uh, earlier on today and there's a lot of really interesting stuff in it. And you liked it? Yeah, I really liked it. I, thought, I think it's a really good book. I think it's really sort of pithy, concise, and very clear. Um, I, I'd like to pick up on a couple of things from near the beginning where you talk about the need for psychological safety. 
And that's right. something we've talked a lot about on the channel, this sort of need for psychological safety, which is kind of paradoxical because a lot of your, your targets with grievance studies and, and a lot of the, your work, you'd assume that the idea of safe spaces is something that you, that you would target and, and would say is, is overdone. But actually, psychological safety is, is a safe space required for these kind of conversations. Yeah, people, the literature is very clear. It's crystal clear. People only change their views from the point of psychological safety. The difference with grievance studies is that's not a one-on-one -on -one conversation with anybody. That was, again, penetration testing, like when you try to bring a bomb through airport security or white hack, white hat uh, hacking when you try to hack into a, a system. We were testing systems. We weren't testing individuals in those systems. And how to have impossible conversations isn't about how to co converse with an institution or a system. It's about how to converse with individuals within that institution and system. And could you unpack that a little bit? What, what is a safe space in this environment? What, so what is psychological safety in this environment and how is it created? Psychological safety, the key point is that you don't invoke a defensive posture in somebody else. So the moment somebody feels defensive, the likelihood of belief revision plummets. I'm not necessarily saying that has to be your goal to have a conversation with belief revision, but one of my goals in the Gorgias, Plato says that it's, it's better to be refuted than it is to, to refute. And the idea there is if you can have that conversation and revise your own beliefs, that's the pinnacle, that's the goal, that's the highest. So there are multiple types of conversations. There's conversations that deal with truth. This is the basic binary. And then there's conversations in which one engages to revise somebody's belief or perhaps their own belief. Even on both of those conditions, psychological safety is paramount because that's when people's defensive postures go down. When they, when they, invent, when they evoke a defensive posture, they won't revise their beliefs. It doesn't mean that if they don't have a defensive posture, they will. But it just means that it's a probability continuum. It just means they're more likely to do that. Mm. And I don't know if I don't know if you're familiar with the the idea of like polyvagal theory. Yes, I watched your episode. Yeah, yeah, it's something that we've been we did a whole piece around the science and psychology of. Um, I think we called it the science and psychology of polarization, but you could also have called it the science and psychology of difficult conversations. Mm -hmm. And it's, I was struck reading your book how, how much what you'd written mirrored what we talked about, especially the value of curiosity. Because it, from, the, from polyvagal theory, curiosity and defensiveness cannot coexist. If you're curious, you're not defensive, and if you're defensive, you're not curious. And you mentioned, you use the word curious quite a lot in your book. Yeah, and uh, there's an ancient philosophical adage, wisdom begins in wonder. So when people start wondering about things, and I just, I just want to say, I think that's the tragedy of our age right now, is that people don't wonder. They don't wonder aloud. They certainly don't wonder on social media. I've had a lot of thoughts that I'd like to just tweet out or put on social media because I'm wondering, but then I'd get, I don't know the word, I, I don't know the word to use beside gangbang, but... Dogpiled? Dogpiled would be a better word, yeah. I, I would be dogpiled by people, moron, grifter, idiot, should have known that. And do I really want to look through 50 examples of people calling me a moron, an idiot, and a grifter, and a Nazi because I was curious about something and I wanted somebody's feedback? So one of the things we've, do, we've done in our current culture is that we've robbed ourselves of the ability to wonder. And particularly, we've robbed ourselves of the ability to wonder out loud and wonder out loud in an academic environment. So we don't, we, we actively discourage wondering and when people think that they have the answers to questions, they don't wonder anymore. W why would you wonder if you thought you had the answer to a question? There's nothing to wonder about. Can you tell me a little bit about the competition that you're running and what you hope to achieve through it? Yeah, so Impossible Conversations was initially brought to us through Peter Bogosian and James Lindsay's book idea we talked to Pete and Jim um, we're friends of theirs and and it just seemed as though there was a real strong alignment between what they were trying to achieve with the book and what letter is trying to achieve so we launched the competition with the view to bring people together from different parts of the ideological spectrum to have long-form thoughtful meaningful good faith conversations across the divide 
the judging panel consists of some relatively big names in the uh, public intellectual space, and they'll be assessing the conversations as they come in and selecting some winners. In addition to the prize pool that the winning conversationalists will, um, will share in, they'll also appear on a number of podcasts and be publicized on Area Magazine. So we're pretty excited about the next couple of months. Uh, the conversation will run between now and early November. And just to get a sense, if you said that a lot of your best conversations were around the dinner table, what were those topics of conversation? What were you guys talking about that, that you felt were not being replicated online? I suppose that the, it wasn't that the topics weren't being replicated. It was more the style of the conversation. I think one of the things that we've realized, uh, particularly as we've been building letters, is that the style of communication amongst our family is uh, quite unique. Um, Aggressive. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think it, maybe it's part of the South African culture, but I guess the goal is to put a proposition on the table and then have everyone else destroy it and, and your confidence. Um, and it was always seen as a non-personal, impersonal thing where it was what matters here is what's true uh, regardless of the, I guess, the, the intention. So what people were trying to do around the dinner table was actually establish why it is that something's true or why it isn't true. And but done in a, in a good faith way. And I think that element of good faith is fundamental to the best quality mm. conversations. It doesn't matter how much two people disagree, but if they come to the table respecting one another, um, playing by, I guess, a s rules of engagement that include being open to changing your mind, um, being genuinely curious about the person's position that you're debating. Those are the kinds of things that we experienced growing up and to don't, you don't see that very often, I don't believe, uh, on the internet. It's, it's very tribal and combative and it seems to create echo chambers. Yeah, I've actually noticed in speaking to other people that we can be quite abrasive, or at least apparently so, <laughs> to others. Because we, we play a different game in conversation, I think, than, than uh, most other people. Where it's, it's kind of merciless in that you, you can attack the person um, as hard as you like, but it's, it's, it's attacking the ideas. And most people, in my experience, uh, outside of our small you know, cult of uh, family and friends, um, you know, they, they, they take that as an attack on them. Mm. And that's never been, it's always been about discovering what's true. So, you know, mm. as Clyde said, it's not that we were engaging in a specific topic. It's that there's a curiosity amongst us and our friends about figuring out what's true and um, realizing that we're all, you know, uh, pretty ignorant on, on virtually every topic mm. and, um, and using one another to, to get closer to the truth. Yeah, it kind of reminds me, I've heard Eric and Brett Weinstein talk about how it was for them growing up and how they used to, they used to have certain rules or certain formulations that are very similar to that about interrogating people's perspectives and interrogating our own perspectives like almost, yeah, really ruthlessly. I don't know if you've heard them talking about that before and wondered if there's any similarities. Hmm. I haven't, but we'll take any similarities that uh, <laughs> comparison to the, the Weinstein brothers that we can get. <laughs> cool, I don't think either of you have got the hair for it. Give us time, give it time. <laughs> I mean, the main reason that we're sitting down or the, 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 the particular thing that's happening at the moment is this competition on letter, uh, which is about impossible conversations which also coincides with the book by Peter Boghossian and James Lindsay, who I know you, so you're one of the judges on the letter competition. Mm -hmm. And also you're, you, you were working with James and Peter on the grievance studies piece. I'd just love you to, to talk a little bit about that background and what you think, or what you're hoping to get from this, the, the competition uh, on letter. Well, um, our, our project, it, it was, of course, about showing a problem that we saw to be happening in the academic left. And a lot of that does come down to not being able to talk about it straightforwardly. So we had been, we, we came from this new atheist background. So we were criticising liberal ideas and unsubstantiated truth claims 
uh, but mostly from religion and mostly because of where we are geographically from Christianity. But when this rise of postmodern ideas in the form of social justice, scholarship and activism really started escalating around 2015, it became harder and harder for us to avoid this. So we have been addressing this. We've written a lot of essays saying what we thought the problems were. A lot of people responded that we were um, nut picking, that there wasn't an in-depth problem, that um, there'd always some crazy papers. So yeah, we decided to go into it, spend a year within the system, really work out how it worked, get some things published. For, uh, if nothing else, people would then not be able to say, you don't know what you're talking about. And that, that was how that project um, came about. But as it comes up for, for having those difficult conversations, we just, just, just not... Just to recap for people who might not know, so then you, you managed to get, I think, was it seven pieces published in yes. different journals? Yeah, in our project, we, we wrote 20 papers, um, which um, were either really methodologically awful or absurd or unethical. And it, it's, they sort of made claims that weren't warranted by what we... Uh, were showing, so that they were theoretical interpretations. We had seven of them accepted, six of them we'd retired, but um, seven of them were still in play, and we had um, great hopes of, of five of those, but we had to stop because we got found, not by the journals, but by journalists. So um, that, that was our project. Had we been able to continue, uh, for another sort of six months or so, I think yeah, we, we would have got um, 10, 12, even 15 in. We were our, our success rate was increasing to near 100. So it was um, it's really very easy to churn out this stuff if you just make the right claims and quote the right people, and that, that isn't scholarship. Mm. And so, yeah, just to talk about um, the impossible conversations on, on letter. What are your hopes for the platform? What are your hopes for the competition? Well, I'm, I'm a big fan of Letter because I think it has got the ability to get people talking to each other as human beings, which doesn't really happen when you're on Twitter or something like that. Then you've got, um, you've got people just sort of sniping at you from all angles and it's so, such a short space. It, it really is just good for sort of throwing daggers at each other. But if you get people willing to have an in-depth, thoughtful conversation and they're writing back and forth in their own time, they can consider what they're saying, they can consider what the other person is saying, then it's much more like you're speaking to another human, it's much more like you have a responsibility to be thoughtful and I think um, good things can result from that. I feel like the book is very timely because there's a lot of focus now on why conversations break down and the, the sense that we can't really move forward until we start from this kind of almost like the foundations of any kind of solution to many of the problems we're seeing involve having these generative conversations. So I'd like to ask you first, why do you think, do you agree that it's very timely and why do you think it's really timely? Yeah, I do actually. I think it, it taps right into a vein of what's going on by some luck because uh, I feel like uh, it was very timely when we wrote it and then a period went by where it would have been less. And now there seems to be something of a renaissance of people wanting to reach across aisles and talk to people and understand one another better, try to figure out where people are coming from. Uh, so I do think that the book is timely uh, because it's geared toward the idea of having conversations with people with whom you don't agree. And I think kind of the cultural moment we find ourselves in is one in which there's been a lot of polarization. Of course, I'm speaking primarily in the US context. I don't know quite how bad it is anywhere else, but in the United States, obviously, there's very little um, social or political capital to be had by crossing the political aisle. If you're on the left, you have to spend time with people on the left and only criticize people on the right. If you do talk to somebody on the right, you have to stick their feet to the fire and everything else. And uh, vice versa, the same thing, you know, I hear people, I live in the southeastern United States, which is very conservative. And uh, I hear people, you know, blaming the liberals, and the liberals for everything. And just in the left, ugh, the left, blah, blah, blah. And it's just this very divisive, uh, I mean, social identity theory gone mad kind of environment in which people aren't speaking to people who have uh, different views very much. And so this has gone on for long enough where I feel like there's this real hunger 
from people who are tired of all of the, the so-called politically exhausted people who are tired of all of this division and fighting to be able to just start being friends again, to, to understand what people think and, and say and where they're coming from. Um, but most importantly, to start generating relationships and communities again, where everything doesn't have to be a political battle to the death and just, you know, people unfriending each other and bailing out. And I think there's just this moment now where people are hungry to be able to know how to talk to people again. There is a sense that there are new sort of political dividing lines. And certainly the issue of social justice has become one of those kind of real sort of fault lines, probably more and more over the last few years and I, I guess from the from the grievance studies papers that you put out you will be seen as falling definitely on one side of those of that yeah. fault line um, mm -hmm. and I'd, I'd love to hear your, your, your thoughts on that um, do you think there's a new political configuration going on uh, yeah and no it's complicated I don't think that the that the liberal or I guess left and right dichotomy has actually broken down I think it's kind of been it's starting to be suspended, but I believe it's kind of a temporary arrangement. Uh, I don't think that the the battle between kind of a progressive, liberal, open idea of society versus a conservative one is, I mean, it's just too fundamental. It's the, it's the gas pedal and the brake pedal it's of, of society, and you're going to have people who fall on each side of that. There is certainly, I feel like what we've, we've actually run into is a situation where you have politics as usual on one level, and then there's like this meta-political issue where you have um, forces both on the far right and on the far left that are kind of against the overarching liberal project in their own ways. It's really they're doing the same thing, but pointed in opposite directions. And... Um, because the the kind of meta political issue has to be settled before we can get back to politics, ugly as it is, as usual, um, there's an there's an agreement that's kind of taking place to set aside the small battle in order to fight the bigger battle. Uh, so I don't think there's quite a realignment going on, like a lot of people are suggesting. I think it's slightly more complicated than that. It's more like a temporary truce. Uh, the way I've characterized it in the past by metaphor is um, you can imagine, you know, on a, a football pitch, you've got, you've got two teams, maybe the red team and the blue team. And uh, obviously they're at metaphorical war with one another in, in the game. And right now there are people coming in from the outside, whether they represent one side or the other or some of both doesn't matter who are essentially telling them, no, no, this game won't be played anymore. And, the red team and the blue team are like, screw you, we're all footballers and we're going to play the game and we'll go back to being against each other when we can play the game again. And so I feel like that's sort of the, the mood of the moment is that there, uh, Peter has phrased it that the aliens have come down and you put your own political squabbles aside to deal with the aliens when the aliens have come down. And I think that that's actually not a bad way to look at it. Mm. And I mean, what I'm really interested in and want to explore in the piece that I'm doing at the moment about letter and about the kind of the broader topic of impossible conversations is it feels like whatever the dividing lines are now in society, it's very easy for that, e even that request for conversations across the divide uh, to be itself, like for some people, it's seen as suspicious. It's seen as you saw what happened to the, the idea of the intellectual dark web. It was almost immediately seen as a sort of Trojan horse for reprehensible ideas. So even the idea of free speech and even the idea of dialogue itself is now in certain areas considered part of, um, uh, it is considered suspicious. So how do we have these conversations in an environment where the whole idea of it is starting to become suspicious? I, I think that this sort of breaks down into a lot of, of different um, things. I think what people are doing when what they're reacting against is the extremes on the other side. So if, um, yeah, we can see that something like the intellectual dark web or um, even sort of centrism or liberalism, some of the identitarian leftists can see this as part of a far right, maybe a gateway carrying water for, a, you know, a drug to water. Ugh all of this, this kind of nonsense. So we've got to try and break those down, yeah. But I think the way that we can do this is by the people who aren't absolutely committed to defending their, 
their own side and, and showing the problems on the others, those who will concede that they have extremists of their own and who want to find common ground with people just over the bridge, I think that is who is going to have the best kind of conversations and I think there's a lot more of them than we think there are. I think very few people are completely lost um, to either a far right or a far left ideology. So it's looking for the people who are sympathetic to those perspectives but are open to dialogue? Yeah, and they don't have to be. I, I could have a conversation with um, a libertarian, even though my um, economics are close to socialist, because I could understand that he is actually someone who wants um, things, who wants good things for the world. Uh, in the in Impossible Conversations book, they say they point out that nearly everyone wants good things. Nobody who has a political position thinks what is going to screw society up most. Let's go for that. So having that kind of conversation, I could talk to a libertarian, I could talk to a social justice activist, or even a racist or a homophobe, if I assume that they're not just evil, but that we disagree. And perhaps I can bring them round to seeing my point of view and understand where they're coming from better, even if I never agree with them. Because there's a lot of arguments, or there's a lot of accusations of bad faith being lobbed around. Yeah. And it almost seems like the... The accusations of bad faith, especially from the centre and the, the centre-right, are often used in a similar way to the sort of no-platforming tactics on the left. Like I hear a lot of people refusing to engage by saying, well, these are, these are bad faith people. My, my sense is, whether that's true or not, surely those, if, if it's true, then those arguments need to be exposed as such. Um, what do you think? Do you, do you get the sense that that phrase, bad faith, is overused? I, I do, to a certain extent, because it gets applied to me and that, that really isn't the case, but I think as well that we're in a situation in which bad faith is rewarded. The kind of conversations that we're having at the moment, um, when they're politically charged, it is much more about finding a way to interpret what the other person is saying, least charitable way possible, um, most problematic, and people on both sides will, will do that. They'll seize straight on that opportunity as a chance to strike a blow, and that's how conversations are happening. Mm. So, or also to signal to your own tribe that you're, yeah, that it's more about signaling to your own tribe than it is trying to enter into dialogue with the other person, for example. Yes, I mean, it, it's trying, it's trying to, to just completely demonise uh, the other side and, and signal your own loyalty to your own side, and that, I think, can legitimately be called bad faith. So I think we need to try to restore if we ever had it, I think we did, an expectation of charity, of reasonableness, of really trying to understand what the other person is saying, of steel manning, as you will. So I, I think that's something that we need to do at the moment when it comes to bad faith. You can either be wrong or right with that. If you're accusing somebody of speaking in bad faith and they, in fact, are not, and it's your prejudice that no one can actually believe what they're saying genuinely, then they have to think about whether they themselves are acting in bad faith. And you mentioned steel manning. Mm. Could you steel man postmodernism? Yes. Yes, the, uh, po what the postmodernists were concerned about was an over-simplistic uh, adherence to sets of ideas. They weren't being criticised. Uh, modernists were quite um, naive and idealistic. They thought that everything was just getting better, that science had the answer to everything. And so postmodernism wanted to deconstruct these ideas, wanted to show that they had flaws, wanted people to trust less in big overarching explanations and to think about how power can be affecting these stories and how it can work in the service of power. So that is the benefits of postmodernism. The reason that I still don't think it has worth anyway is that there are other ways to do this. There is liberalism and there is, is science. Science itself is self-correcting, it's sceptical. So as long as the institutions of science allow people to challenge certain ideas, uh, require replication, require falsification, that's the best sceptical system we've got. Postmodernists didn't invent scepticism. And if we look at history, the, the recent history before uh, postmodernism arose, it is a history of grand narratives being challenged and overcome. Feudalism went, patriarchy, imperialism, slavery, they were all overcome before postmodernism. So while the postmodernists do have a good, um, good, in, good intent, and I, I know what they're about, they're just not the best way 
to do it. A lot of people say, well, this is either a straw man or these are just limited to university campuses. Very few people actually believe these. Um, how, do, how do you respond to that as a, as a criticism? Well, that's uh, chapter nine of the book I've just finished writing. And we're looking at, at the ways this has come out into society, the public shamings, the call for, for firing um, in various sort of different departments. Have you seen what's happening in young adult books at the moment? People are withdrawing their books. It's a really kind of toxic, enclosed environment. We saw one of those at Evergreen um, College as well, where that got completely and enthralled to uh, the ideas of Robin DiAngelo. So we see these hot spots of it, and we see ideas where, where you know, celebrities are accused of cultural appropriation or um, in, in, you know, in, uh, or, or not representing. That there's either a lack of representation of minority groups or there's cultural appropriation of them. And it's very difficult for anyone to navigate through that. So I think a lot of people can still go through their lives knowing nothing about any of these social justice ideas until they do, because it's quite arbitrary. If you are in a situation where you say the wrong thing and it is picked up by the wrong person, that could be your introduction to, to social justice ideas. But your book is about how you bridge those, bridge across divides. How do you decontaminate the, because it always almost feels like in, in some areas, the whole idea of free speech is being seen as a kind of stalking horse for the right or for, for dangerous ideas. How do you decontaminate that and how do you kind of unpick it? Because it seems a very complex uh, picture right now. Oh, that's easy. Um, I would ask them why they believe that. I know that sounds silly, but um, and then I would truly listen to what they had to say. Yeah. Now, keep in mind, that sounds simple, and it is, but there are some people, again, who don't want to have a conversation. Are you familiar with Daryl Davis? No, I don't know the name. You should absolutely, and I would urge every single person watching or listening to this to Google Daryl Davis. Daryl Davis is a black man. He's also a mu musician who is fairly, I don't know anything about jazz, but evidently he's a fairly accomplished jazz musician, but he goes in to talk to Ku Klux Klan members. He's, he's an actual, he literally physically walks into rally, not online, he's not be hiding behind his keyboard, he physically walks in, he befriends them, and he has a closet full of 20 abnegated hoods to prove how effective he is. Recently he was at a conference when he was called a racist, and the conference was boycotted. Daryl Davis, the man with an impeccable pedigree, credentials, the, the ideal credentials for being an anti-racist, who himself possesses an oppression variable, an intersectional characteristic. He is, um, was framed by, as a racist and called a racist by Antifa, and his statement on Facebook is utterly fascinating about, he's been called every, the N-word, every word in the book, but never a racist until recently. So we have to come to a realization of two things. One, there are some people with whom conversation is simply impossible. It's simply, he, Daryl Davis invited Antifa folks to have a conversation with him. They refused. That's the first thing. The second thing is if we really want to be effective in conversations and having conversations, ideally what would have to change is the bedrock of the value. So the older I get, the more I realize that this is all about values. And so if we can help people value free exchange, open ideas, communication, but the way to do that is to start with listening. You have to listen first. If you want to be listened to, you have to listen to others first. That's the key. One, one more quick thing, if I may. I, I was just on a writing retreat with some friends and somebody came to that writing retreat who I'd never met, who was a stranger. I really liked him, really smart guy. And he was also, to say the least, an Antifa sympathizer. And we started having these conversations and I said to him in the course of these conversations, I would love for you to get some of your buddies and have a conversation. He said, well, what would you want to have a conversation with him about? And I said, he said, what's the one thing you want to have a conversation with him about? And I said, I would want to know why they think physical violence is justified. 
It's the one thing. He said, well, you can't do that. You have to work up to that. That takes, you know, a lot of talking and getting to know them, etc. And I thought to myself, okay, I'm willing to do that, but you shouldn't have to do that. The problem is that that value, the value system that those folks have is so tainted and so corrupted that being willing to talk about why you would physically injure someone and perpetrate violence on them should be the first thing you talk about. It shouldn't have to be something you work up to. I wonder if you've considered this as well, is that even in certain areas, for example, you have Helen Pluckrose and Heather Hyang and a couple of other judges, and in certain circles they're already quite, and I know, I know Helen finds it quite um, difficult to imagine that she has enemies, but she's a controversial figure now on Twitter because of the grievance, stand, scan, grievance scandal papers and a few other kind of culture war dynamics that are going on in the States, how, how, do, how, do you avoid, how do you avoid looking like you're taking sides in the culture war when for some parts of the culture war, even the whole idea of good faith dialogue has been contaminated, the idea of free speech they see as almost like this right wing plot for hiding bigoted perspectives. You must be aware of that dynamic, and what, what, do you, what do you make of it? How do, you, how, do you, how do you work in an area where even those, those values are now politicized? Yeah, I mean, I think at some, at some point you have to decide which values matter the most. And for people who think that good faith engagement is somehow radioactive, uh, let it probably isn't the platform for them. Although... We would welcome them and we would encourage them to, to come on and share their ideas. If, if the idea of a good faith conversation is political, um, I don't know that you can even get to the starting line. So I think from, from that perspective, free speech is paramount. And regardless of what your ideas are, if you can't even get to the starting point, there's nowhere to go and there's no progress to be made. And uh, I think if that costs us a cohort of users, that's fine. I think you have to worry about it, but I think you have to push ahead regardless. I think, I think you can mitigate a lot of this through a genuine conversation. Uh, I think what Quillette does is remarkable, but they are standalone blogs and standalone, standalone pieces. All the exchanges on Letter are, are genuine conversations that feature two people from the outset. So I think that does mitigate that to some extent, is that right at the beginning of the piece, you're getting two very different perspectives uh, from people from often totally different parts of the ideological or political spectrum. Uh, so I think that offsets it to some extent, but I think we're going to have to wade through this minefield as carefully as we can um, but we have to we have to forge ahead because I think it's the the consequences of not having these conversations are actually increasing polarization echo chambers, uh, which manifest in real world consequences. I don't know if you describe yourself as kind of um, IDW adjacent. There was the sort of the idea of the the intellectual dark web being uh, based around kind of good faith dialogue, mm -hmm. and that that kind of first kind of broke through maybe about just over a year ago. And mm -hmm. we're in a culture now where even the idea or even the, the, the concept of free speech seems to have been weaponized itself or, or there seems to be a lot of skepticism about it from certain parts of the political spectrum. I'm thinking mm -hmm. kind of mainly from the left, but mm -hmm. how can you have, how can you have a, a book or a movement or a, um, a concept of, of free speech and impossible dialogue when some people see even that concept as a kind of stalking horse for represent for reprehensible ideas. Yeah. Um, how, how do you, how do you communicate across the divide when even the idea in some places is that trying to communicate across the divide and have difficult conversations about difficult topics is itself considered a suspect position. Right. Um, so it depends, obviously, if you're trying to have that conversation and it's not moving forward because the person that you're speaking with, for example, on an individual one-to-one -one level, 
is shutting it down and saying, well, you know, dialogue itself is complicity with some evil or whatever. And they refuse to have a conversation, then that's what it is. The, the, the book does define impossible conversation by starting with saying that there has to be a conversation. If there's no conversation, um, you're talking, people are talking, but you're not in the realm of a conversation at all. If, if that's not what, what's there. So, um, that becomes a difficulty. But then if you're talking about that idea and trying to get to that idea, so, okay, let's look at this, uh, is talking about certain ideas or, or is free speech itself, you know, a stalking, a stalking horse for, for bigotry or some evil or supremacy or whatever, that itself is a conversation topic. You know, is, is, is that something you really believe? Why do you believe it? Let's, how did you arrive at that conclusion? Can you give me some examples of, of why you, you know, where that goes awry? And, you know, you can start to try to ask questions that dig into somebody's epistemology. You can start asking them questions to help yourself understand their perspective better. At the end of the day, one of the last things is if somebody won't have a dialogue with you that's otherwise productive, you can always default to just trying to learn why they believe what they believe. It doesn't have to turn into some, you know, uh, some set of agreement or even to say something like, well, we agree to disagree. You don't even have to go there. You can just, I, okay, I don't understand your perspective. Instead of saying, I disagree with that, that view. I, I don't even understand that. Can you just, I just want to hear all you have to say about that and help me understand it and let them do a lot of the talking. Um, Maybe all that happens is you listen and you learn. Maybe you're actually going to, to have an open mind and con be convinced that there's a point there that you didn't understand. Like, for example, when I spoke with the Christians and it's like, well, I don't like their point and I don't agree with their point, but at least I see there is a point. Um, they're not maniacs. <laughs> uh, and maybe it is one of these situations where we talk about a couple of different examples in the book of... Um, well-known cognitive effects where people speak into their own ignorance, realize their own ignorance and end up moderating their own beliefs just by talking too much. Um, not in the sense, you know, that you might say with an interviewer giving somebody enough rope for them to hang themselves, but rather just confronting that the things that the, the reality is a lot of the things that we speak about, uh, many people have heard of the Dunning-Kruger effect. A lot of the things that we speak about, we don't know as well as we think we know. There's a, a cognitive, in cognitive science, there's, a, there's an effect that's been described called the illusion of explanatory depth that we discuss in the book. And in, in, in that people tend to think they know some things better than they do because they know that other people know them. And they're kind of leaning on the fact that it is known to, to extend their own uh, expertise. And so if you actually have them just keep describing, you know, well, how will that work? And so, okay, so, you know, you see free speech is a stalking horse for, for, for supremacy, but how does it work in practice? So if we limit hate speech and then somebody comes along and defines, you know, what, what a minority group is trying to say is hate speech, what happens then? And you just let them talk. Uh, a lot of times they'll, they'll find that there are holes in the, in the logic that they hadn't previously examined. Um, and we'll go away with moderated beliefs. A couple of cognitive scientists showed this with, with mundane things and a couple more showed it that it happens with political beliefs as well. Um, so that itself becomes a discussion topic, but if it is in a situation where, um, and hopefully people can change their mind on that one, but, uh, if it comes to the point where you're actually trying to have dialogue with somebody who doesn't want to, um, all you can do is shake their hand and thank them for their time and, and go away. Sometimes that's, that's the limit. And, or you can switch goals. Like, you know what, screw it. Let's just talk about Frisbee. You know, we both, we both like tacos. Let's go there. Um, and just change the subject and do something different. Sometimes it's, it's just how it is. You talk later in the book about how difficult the most difficult conversations are when you're dealing at the level of values. Yes. Why do we feel that, and I'm pretty sure there's been neuroscience on this that shows that when our values are contradicted or when people are, that it's as if people are threatening our, our self, our, our physical person. Why is that? Why do you think that's the case? Well, let's unpack that before we talk about why that's the case. If it's an identity issue, 
if it has identity level salience, that's when those beliefs are very difficult to revise. So moral beliefs in general, but beliefs that relate to identity in particular. That's why when you have conversations with people and we're kind of jumping into the end of the book, you know, you're listening and et cetera, et cetera, which are vital and shouldn't be over glossed. But that's why when you have conversations with folks, the conversations about moral issues are very difficult because it relates to their sense of personal identity. Good people believe this. I am a good person. Therefore, I believe this. It's interesting. I do an exercise in class when I ask people what percentage of their beliefs they think are true. And sometimes people find that jarring. And I write the numbers 90 you know, 100, 90, 80, and, and then after a couple of questions, I, I'll, I'll write up, you know, five people believe it's 90, four people believe. Occasionally, actually, I get some people who are around the 30s, which is, I don't know how they navigate reality, but then I'll give another scale and say, what percentage of your moral beliefs do you think are true or your religious beliefs? And then those numbers are far higher. But the exact opposite should be the case, right? The, the, the beliefs for which you have less evidence, you should hold in, in less confidence for those beliefs. They should be commensurate. So we've miscalibrated our beliefs and, it, and our belief calibration unit should be higher for the unevidenced beliefs that are moral. But, it, but in fact, it's not the case. When was the last time that you changed your mind about something significant? In what domain of thought? Um, any, just a significant, significant change. Uh, almost every day, uh, specifically almost every day with regard to something my daughter tells me or my, uh, I'll give you quick examples about, I changed my mind about diets. I've changed my mind about something I've been told my whole life, I intermittent fast now. My whole life I heard breakfast is the most important meal of the day. But significantly, I, I heard that from people I loved and who loved me and cared about me. So it gave that belief an emotional valence that it wouldn't otherwise have had. And what about politically or philosophically? Oh, I've changed my, my beliefs very widely. Uh, it always, I've changed my beliefs about, um, I've always been very socially liberal and economically, I find myself all over the spectrum. But, I'm now thinking in some kind of a crisis of capitalism, thinking that capitalism has got us into our ecological mess, and it's really the Achilles heel of the whole system. So I'm now questioning some basic capitalistic values with the huge data point of the species-threatening events that we see in front of us. So I've changed my mind about that. I've changed my mind about torturing people to extract information in times of war. They call it the ticking bomb philosophy and scenario. scenario. I've changed my mind about a wide range of things. And at the same time as your book is coming out, there's the letter wiki um, project, which is about bringing people in dialogue with each other. Who do you think should be in dialogue with each other? Who would you really like to see thrash it out in that format? I would like to see the only people who would never do it. Uh, I would like to see Robin D'Angelo in her work on white fragility have a conversation with Heather with uh, with Helen Pluckrose. I would like to see people advocate. I'd like to see Judith Butler in conversation, maybe with James Lindsay, uh, or or with Camille Paglia, maybe. Or with Camille Paglia, that would be fine. Maybe they would oppose to him being a male. Um, Camille Paglia would be great. Or or maybe with Christina Hoff Summers. I'd like to see specifically, so, so, so I think Wiki, I think the Wiki project and the Rathbones are fantastic. I think this is exactly what we need at this point in our culture. We need to have conversations. We need to be talking across divides. And I also think, see I just used a technique from the book. I used and instead of but. <clears throat> and I also think that, <clears throat> Excuse me, I think that part of the problem is that it's like in the presidential debates. When you're winning, you want fewer debates. And when you're, I don't know how, I'm saying about in American context, I can't speak and I don't, I have no idea. Yeah, it's the same in the UK, yeah. Okay, so, so when you're winning in the polls, you don't want no debates. And the, 
the loser, or the person who's currently losing, wants a lot of debates. So currently, intersectionality is dominating the cultural landscape. So they don't really want to have those conversations because they're winning the culture war at this point. So the question is, how do we get back to helping people value the right things? And part of what it means to value the right things is discourse, dialogue, and open conversation. So once you leave, the good news, that's the bad news. <clears throat> the good news is that once you leave that sliver of a space of intersectionality, virtually everybody is willing to talk to you about virtually anything. People love to have an opportunity to air their beliefs. In fact, in the episode, um, in the poly, polyvagal theory, one of the, th the things that your guest talked about, and he's absolutely correct from the research literature, is that people want to be listened to. They don't mind being disagreed with. In fact, sometimes people love it, but they want to be listened to. And the, <clears throat> the wiki platform gives people an opportunity not only to be listened to, but to have other people listen to in a very polite and considerate way what they're doing. The good news is once you're out of that thin sliver of society intersectionality, the vast majority of people are willing to talk to you about the problems with plastic in the oceans, the ecological crises, homelessness, immigration. Those conversations are all very, very possible. They might be difficult, but they're very possible because... So here's, here's the thing about the, the ecological problem. Here's the thing with our ecological problems, our homeless problems, etc. The moment someone believes there's a moral reason attached to a belief or hold, to hold on to a belief. That problem is so much more difficult to solve. So the moment someone believes that they're a better person because of their faith, the instant that happens, they're less likely to revise their faith-based beliefs. Nobody believes. I don't think you could find literally anybody who believes we're all better off for having more plastic in the ocean we're all better off for having more CO2. Now, you'll have people disagree about the solution to that, but that's great. That's what we do in democracies. And we need to recover that ability to have a conversation. And I would argue that the more morally relevant a topic is, the more important it is to have an open discussion about that topic. So we're not having those topics in the university system right now, to be sure. So. The wiki platform is a fantastic way to have those difficult, if not impossible, conversations with people across deep divides. Who do you think, um, who, who do you think would be really beneficial to engage in the letter project? I'd, I'd, I'd like to get, to get all of them in there, all of the, the, um, the critical theorists, but I, I don't see that it could work um, with, with their mentality. What we need really I think of people who aren't quite there yet. I think the the average person, the average sort Why? of what academic. Why? got involved? Well, I'm, uh, imagining a conversation with Robin D'Angelo, if if she were to speak to me, because I am also white, she would just be telling me that it is impossible for me not to be racist, and I must understand that that she is correct. She, she's given talks on how to speak to to white people who believe it's possible not to be racist. And this, it's really just ways of um, telling them they're wrong. However, if a black or Asian person were to have a conversation with her and disagree with her, then she wouldn't be able to say that precisely. She'd have to just apologise and take on the criticism. So I was, I was talking to uh, Abed Omar recently, and he's um, a South, South Asian, I think, or Arabic, and he was saying that he'd like to say to her, stop infantilizing me, stop making me seem as though I am a victim and I don't understand what is happening, I don't have views of my own. And, and I said to him, if you said that to her, she would just have to apologize for seeming patronizing, seeming to know your experience. She couldn't actually engage that idea. So it, it's just really impossible to talk to somebody who is that deeply entrenched in the beliefs, but most of us aren't. I think the best we can do with those who are really entrenched is to marginalise them, get them more widely recognised as extremists making unsubstantiated claims. So who would be your ideal, uh, which people would you love to see in dialogue with each other? <sighs> That's something you really need to give me a bit more time hmm. to think about, I'm afraid, so I, I don't know. 
and then as we've seen Richard Dawkins and um, 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 Brett Weinstein having a conversation, I'd, I'd quite like them to continue that. Uh, Jordan Peterson and, and Noam Chomsky would be would be good, I think. Uh, and I always think um, they've talked a lot, though. But Sam Harris and um, and Jordan Peterson, they they tend to break, they tend to come up against each other in, in ways that are interesting to me from someone who shares the epistemology of Sam Harris. But um, otherwise, politically, I don't know. No, that was good. That was some really good names. I think a lot of people would be very interested to see those those dialogues. Yeah, I have thought of two people that I would actually like to have a conversation with now. Great. So there's Jose Medina. Now he's um, the writer of Epistemologies of Resistance and I've used his work a lot and I think his work is brilliant. The way that he is looking at um, epistemological vices and epistemological virtues. But he argues that people who have the virtues are, it's, it's related to identity. So if you have a privileged identity, your, your discourses, your understanding of society are dominant and so you can't see anything else. Whereas if you're a marginalised person, you can see the dominant system and you also have your own. So you have a greater, wider knowledge and you can see outside your own system. Now, I think his an analysis would be really rigorous and good if it wasn't related to identity, if it didn't assume that all women thought the same way, if all black people thought the same way, but if he applied it to echo chambers ideological groups, so I would really like to have a conversation with him about that. And Christy Dotson, uh, leading black feminist epistemologist, she's somebody else I, I really would like to talk to because I read her work and you can just tell how clear she is trying to be. And she really is, she, she, it, she's introducing really complex things but she's taking the reader along, she's reminding me back, she's very sincere and rigorous but again she's starting from the problem of um, epistemological uh, sort of identity so again knowledge depends on what race you are what sex you are so i think she goes very wrong but and she, she also talks about a culture of justification and so she's against the idea that we need evidence for things but when i read her i can't help but think if you just started from a premise of of, of evidence-based reason and individuality, your work would be so valuable on how we understand knowledge. So I would like to talk to both of them and actually yeah, suggest to them, ask them how they would like, how, how they could, could, how I could apply their work differently and if they thought there was any value in that or if I'd completely missed the point. You talk in the book about you, um, sort of almost like ninja level techniques coming from <laughs> hostage, um, hostage negotiation and cult deprogramming. So there's all of yeah. these sort of conversational techniques. I mean, the suspicion is, I'd love to hear a couple of those first before we kind of get into, get into it. What, what do you think is, is the most uh, useful techniques that, you, that are in the book? Well, for me, the most useful technique is certainly not one of the ninja ones. Uh, it is actually uh, let friends be wrong. And I have a very expansive definition of friends. If you're having a conversation with somebody, it, for all intents and purposes, I think that you should treat them as though you're that, that you're friends. So um, the, the most important technique for me is 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 that uh, if if you have some ludicrous belief and you're really um, entrenched in it, I don't have to change your mind. We can focus on other aspects of our relationship. We can I can let you be wrong and become curious about what you believe and why you believe it and ask questions to understand it better. And that may or may not lead you to change your mind, but it will at least generate trust between us. It will uh, engender better understanding. You will feel heard. I will understand better where you're coming from, even if I think you're absolutely insane as a result. And so letting people be wrong is, I think, something we've really lost. Um, another not ninja level technique in the early in the book, the first one mentioned is defining conversational goals. And so everything in a conversation really depends upon knowing why you're having the conversation. So if you and I are having a conversation to um, achieve some workplace end, you know, and I start making it about football, I've, I've gone off the track, right? Or if I start talking about my the fight with my wife or something like that, I've gone, I've, I'm no longer 
attending the goal of that conversation. And I would insist that one of the goals that you should always have or nearly always have in most conversations is to have a goal of maintaining a positive relationship with that person. And so that starts to delimit how far you should be willing to go when you argue or whatever. Maybe the situation is you're sitting down and you're at family dinner and you have that uncle or cousin or brother who just won't leave it alone. How do you navigate that? You know, that kind of thing, understanding that the goal there is to try to have a positive, a net positive experience at the dinner table rather than turning it into a family fight is, is really important. If you want to look at kind of the ninja level stuff or talk about um, the hostage negotiation, uh, there are a few techniques that I really like from hostage negotiation. I mean, I'm not one of these kind of like conversational mastermind type people, but um, one that I find has a lot of value from hostage negotiation is uh, to repeat back. It's a kind of conversational mirroring is to repeat back a few words of what the person just said almost as a question. Uh, it nearly always will get the person to continue talking and to say more. Hostage negotiators are often trying to get the, the criminal they're speaking with to um, admit some piece of information that they can then use as leverage to end the crisis. And so they very frequently will, will try to, a lot of their techniques are meant to keep the person as calm as possible while keeping them talking as much as possible. Because when there's silence, there's no possibility of progress. So for example, um, somebody might come in and say to you, just as a very kind of banal example, um, yeah, so I just got back from the grocery store. And you say, got back from the grocery store. That's it. And then they're very likely to say, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I went to the grocery store to get chicken. And you say, oh, yeah, to get chicken. And <laughs> it's silly. I mean, it sounds, these people off, if you say it with the right tone and that you're actually engaging with them, I'm not doing it well and hypothetical, but in a real conversational environment, it works a little better. They'll say, yeah, I was thinking about making chicken Parmesan for dinner tonight. You know, and you say, well, uh, yeah, chicken Parmesan. And then the, now they're talking about, you know, I really love Italian food. And it, it actually is a technique that is not just used in hostage negotiation. It's actually used by um, clinical mm -hmm. psychologists as well to, to get people to open up and talk more. So if you're trying to get people to open up about their beliefs and understand where they're coming from on a better level, that's a, actually a technique derived straight from hostage negotiation or clinical psychology that anybody can apply with a little bit of familiarity and practice, you can do it in a natural way. I've been doing it to my daughter for months and she had no idea I was doing it until we finally had an open conversation about it the other day when I told her I was doing it and she's like, I didn't even notice. And I know that technique because she had been studying to be a psychologist herself and she had no idea I was doing it to her. It's just to keep the person open-ended and talking more. So that, that's, that's more of a kind of ninja level technique to, to keep somebody opening up and providing information that you can then, you know, ask other questions about or connect over or whatever the goal of the conversation is. I just wanted to pick up on you mentioning the sort of the friends thing. You do have quite a combative um, reputation on online and on Twitter. Oh yeah. I don't count, I don't, this, people will consider this deeply hypocritical. I don't consider, um, I don't consider Twitter conversation. If you want to have a conversation with me, and I think a surprising number of people would be able to attest to this, send me a private message, see how it goes. It's a very different environment. The public environment on Twitter is not conducive to conversation. Uh, every social media platform, every conversational environment in fact has a certain infrastructure to it and that infrastructure ultimately uh, defines how people will work or play or do or act so you can think of it like my favorite metaphor is is to think of like a schoolyard playground or a park having a playground depends on what people put you know is there a slide is there a merry-go-round are there swings is there you know a maze is there a balance beam is there a trampoline? What did they put in that environment? So that's physical infrastructure and that physical infrastructure will dictate how the children play. Now they might get quite creative. They may be using the merry-go-round or something to do something no one would have thought of, or they might be using the seesaw to like, you know, launch the other kid halfway across the yard and rolling around and, and break their arm or something, who knows. But the infrastructure itself defines ultimately a great deal of how that play will will unfold. So Twitter 
the platform is ultimately designed as though each person in some sense is a stand-up comedian on stage and has a huge audience that sometimes yells back. And uh, there's a kind of interaction. It is possible to have a positive interaction, but in some sense to get into long-winded conversations in public on Twitter becomes kind of a, you can imagine you're like you're the, you're the guy on stage and somebody starts having a conversation with you and now you've diverted the show, if you will, and you're doing this thing and other people in the audience are getting ornery and they're jumping in and um, you're on stage and the other person's being loud in front of the whole group. So they want to be heard and they, they, they're trying to make a spectacle of it as well. It's just not the kind of infrastructure that's conducive to having a positive conversation. So I've decided that there's a lot of fun to be had if you don't worry about that and just use the platform as it's actually designed and lean into it. But if you want to have a conversation, take it somewhere more private. We actually have a section in the book talking about social media and the different platforms to some degree and why they are even, even private message, text message type communication is sorely limited. Um, and so while there are some advantages to it, I would say that, that, that which is taking place in the public forum of uh, whether it's messages uh, like uh, like on Twitter, I mean, or like on Facebook or like in discussion forums, something like that. It's a very different environment. You're not actually having a conversation at that point. And when you're ready to have a real conversation, send somebody a note and engage, you know, in a, in a more direct and human way rather than this weird performance way. I mean, I'm thinking about the, the interaction you have with Nicholas Grossman and the article that he wrote for, for ARC Digital. Um, I mean, is it not even, I, I, I hear what you're saying about it, Twitter's not the right platform, but it, do, you, do you regret that? Do you regret having kind of articles out there saying, um, don't, don't preach constructive disagreement if you're not modeling it? Um, no, I actually don't. I'm, I'm a very odd bird in this way. I don't actually think that hypocrisy means very much. Uh, <laughs> I don't. I don't really care if somebody's a hypocrite. If somebody's sitting there with a needle sticking out of their arm telling me not to use heroin, I might think of that being like <laughs> more insight rather than a reason to not believe them. Uh, maybe they know something I don't. Um, but again, I, the Twitter environment, I don't really regret any of the public behavior that I have on Twitter almost ever because it's just not conducive. So I get stuff sent to me all the time. And so Nicholas Grossman, for example, um, I don't mean to be rude, but this message just came to me. I don't know who this guy is. He's nobody. He doesn't, I, I have no context into which he's inserted himself. He said some stuff about being an expert about a topic, but the things that he said seem to uh, both be combative and to stand on, uh, on their, uh, uh, on the head of things that I seem, I think that I know about the topic. And so he's kind of doing this whole, like, you know, let's smack, let's smack this guy down attitude, which is fine. I do that on Twitter all the time. Again, I don't care about hypocrisy, but if you want to try to create a conversation out of it, that's literally exactly the wrong way to go. And I didn't reach out to him first. So I did lol, LOL. That's all I had to say about his, his view. It, he could have followed up with me in a more private way. I guess I could have as well, but I wasn't particularly interested in, getting into what for me was a tangential issue on the matter. Um, I don't actually care that much about the nitty gritties about that topic having to be terrorism. I don't, I'm not an expert in that. I don't care. I guess the reason and, I'm asking is because um, it's quite easy. Like the actual habit, I think if you asked anyone to say, how do you have a constructive conversation? they'd be able to say, well, you've got to respect what your opponent is saying. You've got to take them seriously. You've got to not be dismissive. Like we can all mm -hmm. list those things, but actually right. the doing of it seems to be like, we all get into our, like, we all know this and we get, we get into arguments all the time. Mm -hmm. So I think there is something about whether we're actually modeling that behavior ourselves that, that does, that, that, that is relevant to the, to the conversation. Sure. Sure. Um, and again, it's, it's contextual. Uh, I don't feel like the, I mean, I'm not trying to defend myself. If people don't like me because of this or think I'm wrong, I'm fine with that too. It doesn't bother me one way or the other. Um, I don't think that the, the public facing Twitter context is one that people should be trying to have conversation via at all. In fact, I think that that's a mistake. Direct messages are there for a reason. My direct messages are open. I'm not, I don't hide that fact. Um, 
my email is listed on my Twitter bio. If you want to have a more forthright conversation with me, there are pathways. And uh, I don't have time or energy to be serious on Twitter. I just don't. I mean, I say serious things, but I'm not there to engage in conversation. I make no pretenses that I'm there to engage in conversation. You had a, uh, an encounter with James on Twitter that you then wrote about in an article. And I think it points to... It's one thing to talk about impossible conversations in theory. It's quite another one to have them in, in reality. Can you talk about that interaction and what you, uh, why you wrote that piece on Art Digital? Sure. Uh, so the, the way it started was um, I started the conversation. And um, as I think sometimes you know, goes with Twitter culture, I uh, maybe came in a little hot. Um, but what started it was there were a lot of attention being paid to uh, demonstrations and kind of street violence in Portland um, with uh, Antifa and uh, Proud Boys and some other groups, left-wing, right-wing groups. Um, and uh, there had been some rumors about uh, people uh, throwing uh, milkshakes mixed with concrete that were seriously injuring people. And uh, James wrote something about how even if the rumors aren't true, that it counts that this is terrorism, that merely spreading the rumor is terrorism. And I am a professor who teaches about terrorism and I've written a book about it. And a, something that is important to me is using the word, uh, using it in a, a useful way that I think in many ways um, people have overused the word terrorism to just apply it to things that they don't like and that that muddies the understanding of the term and makes it harder to counter it. Um, and so uh, I wrote something that amounted to uh, that's not terrorism, petulant terrorism isn't a thing, and you know, threats aren't, uh, especially like a, a rumor that turns out not to be true by a group you don't like is not terrorism. Doesn't mean it's good, you know, that's not a value judgment, it's a classification. And uh, his response was to be uh, extremely dismissive of this and sort of mocking um, and uh, to then go about putting a lot of words in my mouth that are basically the opposite of what I think about it, about how that I'm saying that US drone strikes are terrorism. And I wrote a book called Drones and Terrorism in which I say the opposite. And um, where, I don't know, a few others like this, just basically the sort of, the very sort of things I would criticize. And, um, and this went back and forth for a while and where uh, I didn't really think anything of it. And you know, uh, Twitter conversations often go that way. And um, I had started this one and like I said, you know, I was more, um, I quote tweeted him and broadcast it out to my followers. I didn't say, hi, let's have a conversation, you know, about it. I just criticized him without him knowing who I am. Um, and so I didn't think anything of it until I saw a op-ed in the LA Times um, by uh, Lindsay and Bogosian about, uh, I guess, previewing their book about how you should talk to people. And I was just uh, amazed at, at, at the chutzpah of it. I, I kind of couldn't believe that somebody who, and, and this would be one thing sorry, just with me, but uh, many people I know have had similar encounters of where um, Lindsay is very rude or dismissive, condescending, um, very much not practicing anything that was in uh, the op-ed. Um, and so I wrote in response to that because I didn't really think about it, um, the conversation originally. And I just couldn't believe that somebody who uh, practice the exact opposite of that would tell everybody that that's how they should behave. What's your sense of why that conversation broke down and what do you think could, could have been different? The, I mean, the conversation never had a chance to break down because, uh, because I kind of don't know what polite way to put it, because James acted like a dick and he acted like a dick immediately. And I mean, really without hesitation. And then probably the worst part about it was as he continued mischaracterizing what I believe and really just the almost exact opposite of things that I've written many times. Um, then when some reader who's following the conversation said, why aren't you responding to any of his points? And uh, he responded, James meaning responded, oh, I muted him a while ago. So the combination of, um, here, let me sort of mock you and put words in your mouth. And again, mockery on Twitter is, you know, whatever. Uh, perfectly, I think, normal part about it. And, um, you know, people make fun of me or criticize me or whatever. And I think that's totally fine, that that's just part of the medium. Um, but the, 
combination of misrepresenting me on my particular area of expertise, no less, uh, and then not even being willing to uh, listen, using a feature of the application to make sure that he wouldn't even see my responses, struck me as basically the worst possible way that you could have this conversation. And also, I gotta say, if he dropped it, that would have been totally within his rights. If he ignored me, I think that would have been totally fine. It was the combination of uh, engaging in a very dismissive and accurate way mixed with the, the muting of not even hearing the responses. And so I was just really surprised to see somebody say, it's really important that you have to have these conversations. You have to really listen to people. And you know, in, in my article, I had a few direct quotes from it, but how important it was to listen to people and try to consider their point of view and consider this. And where, um, as I spoke to a few people about it, this uh, interaction was uh, what some of them told me a pretty mild version of say how he commonly behaves and it's you know he's not the worst person on twitter there are like some really terrible people on the internet of course um but the i think very much that you have to in a sense practice what you preach if it comes to engaging people that you disagree with or politely engaging because the difficult part about it is not what to do. I think everybody is capable of saying, you should listen to other people and have polite conversations. The difficult part is how to do that. Um, and you know, how exactly do you deal with, say, some, uh, you know, some professor criticizing you when, as he had you know, said, was um, emotional because a friend of his had been attacked um, in those demonstrations? Um, and how do you, in that situation, in a public forum, still act in a way that has that sort of difficult conversation. That's the hard part. And it seems, at least from my experience and from some of those that I've talked to, uh, that he is about as bad at that as anybody. Um, and therefore, it makes me somewhat skeptical of the advice that you should do it uh, if he is incapable of doing it. Because what people need to know is a lesson of how to do it, is to be able to see models of people who act in a way that they should act and see, um, I'll give you a, a good example of somebody, I don't know if you've ever spoken to or aware of on Twitter, but someone who I've you know, criticized say fairly harshly at times, but uh, named Bo Weingard, who um, gets a lot of criticism and both with me and with others, I've seen him then just respond to, why do you think that? Or, you know, um, oh, what, what do you think I got wrong? What evidence do you have that I was wrong? And actually engages on it and he won me over because I still think that uh, Bo is fundamentally wrong about a bunch of things, but I've had a lot of pleasant conversations with him about it or more intellectualized conversations with him about it because he reacted to criticism with, oh, let me hear about it more. You know, let's hear the, the details of it. Let's get the evidence for it. As opposed to, ha, ah, look at this moron. And I bet he thinks all these things. And, um, you know, you can see why that's different. And so I think Bo models the behavior, James doesn't, and acting, walking the walk is the hard part. I had spoken to Nicholas and asked if he, would you be willing to, 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 get, to have a conversation with him on Zoom about, about this topic? Well, I mean, would I? Uh, Is he, that's, he, um, I, I, I've checked see, him. See, that's, a matter, that's a matter of interest. Mm. In principle, of course I would. The, the problem is I don't give a shit about the topic. I don't care whether milkshakes constitute terrorism or not. I literally could not possibly care less about whether that's the case. I made a flippant comment about milkshakes being terrorist in the wake of a friend of mine being pummeled in the street and some terrorism expert wants to come in and talk about the legal and practical matters of terrorism with me because I made a couple of tweets about terrorism. I don't care that much. It's like I moved on. If he wants to come and talk to me about terrorism, he's going to be talking with a non-expert. He can show off and look intelligent or whatever. He can school me or we can disagree or I don't care. It's fine. But the, the topic has no relevance to me. I so I also want to ask questions about whether, whether it does matter how we act on Twitter as well, because that's another, that's another topic that he would, he would disagree I mean, he can, disagree we on. could, we could talk about that too. I'm, quite comfortable defending that it does not really matter how we act on Twitter and people who take Twitter seriously are doing it wrong. Um, well, we can, but, we can try it. I mean, if it doesn't work, then, then I, I just think it's quite nice to have, it seems to be the obvious way of modeling the thing that we're talking about, the impossible conversations, 
a conversation sure. broken down on Twitter that could be had better on. Right. I just don't actually feel like there was a conversation had on Twitter at all. It's a, you know, I conceded almost immediately afterwards that, okay, he has a point and I don't care. Um, I, you know, work seven billion hours a week. And so do I want to set aside two hours of my time to talk to a guy about terrorism and how, how to talk on Twitter? I, whatever. Mm. If, if it's such a must that, uh, you know, it's likely to generate something positive in the world, it's it maybe worth doing. I mean, it's, but, re it's relevant to the topic of the book. I think that's, that's the only reason that I bring it up is that I do think it's relevant to um, the how to have how to have impossible conversations or I mean that's, I guess so sure if you want to try to arrange it and we have time we can we can discuss it Rebel Wisdom is a new sense making platform bringing together the most rebellious and inspiring thinkers from around the world if you're enjoying our content, then you can help us make more by becoming a subscriber, which will give you access to a load of exclusive films. Also, you can then join our group Zoom calls to discuss the ideas in the films, and you can send us ideas for questions for upcoming interviews. We're also looking for talented people to help us out with editing, graphics, music, that kind of thing. And if you're a regular viewer, you'll know we talk a lot about the value of embodying or actually living out the ideas that we talk about. That's why we run regular events in London. Check out the links on the website for more. And hope to see you soon.